What's up, my miners of intelligence and consciousness? I'm Rick Brooks, and this is Rick's Mind. My guest this week is Lathan Gorbett, who is a documentary filmmaker and multimedia producer. We sit down and talk about everything from food to politics. Hope you enjoy. Well, Lathan, it's good to have you back, brother. How are you? Last minute, last minute uh, podcast. I was. This, this uh, is a. La- <laughs> wasn't sure if this was gonna <laughs> come together or what. So I was like, I'll be I wasn't there. either, man. It. <laughs> you, you didn't think I was gonna be on? No, no, no. I was like, I'm just gonna be. I'm just gonna make myself available on the days that I'm available, and if it works, it works. And uh, I'm sure that you're not short for guests right now. It seems like, and I, I can bring it up in the podcast. But I've I listened to a couple of your podcasts recently, and um you've made some uh you've made some gains my friend i well i appreciate it man we've been working really really hard you know we're we're in the midst of creating a system right like this is um honestly six months of actually really working and we we're we have a a system we're gonna bring probably another team member on and we are just slowly develop, developing systems of success. And it's, you know, I, you know, again, I got DeMarco on point crushing with the posting and it's sound engineering. We, we've got more microphones. A lot of shit is, is, is being worked on. And it just goes to show like if you keep working and you keep, you have a plan and you never give up that you start making traction and just start you know, reaching out to people right now. We're trying to, to crack into scientists. Cause I want to talk about space and aliens and like there's all sorts of crazy stuff that is going on on that front. Um, to pull this up, it's O Oma, O Yuma, Yuma, something like that with Avi Lobo or whatever. Amora Mora. Amora Mora. Yeah. I want to talk to someone about that, but yeah, man, we, we've just been, um, We've been crushing and reaching out to other podcasters and other people that are, you know, trying to trying to make it on on social media and whatnot. Because we're not, you know, we're we're not huge yet, but like, there's a lot of people that are up and coming. So, but one of the things, really, why I wanted to bring you on is you are in the midst of recording or creating a documentary about food, and what we've kind of you know, kind of wet, wet our toes a little bit in the food industry and like speaking to chefs and stuff. And I wanted to, I wanted to know like, what was the inspiration for creating this documentary? What's it's called? All that good stuff, man. And who you've talked to. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if you remember, but I have a background in culinary arts. I worked in the food industry for 12 or 13 years, back of the house in front of the house, went to culinary school and all that stuff. Um, and so, you know, when I was in culinary school, I was handed, um, Kitchen Confidential had just come out, Anthony Bourdain's book. And Mm -hmm. my mind started drifting more towards like, I I like the idea of like, I don't know, reaching people in a different way. I don't think I wanted to stay in the back of the house. And I think that book and some of his life will kind of illustrate why the back of the house of the restaurant is, um, it's not for everybody. You know, I had a kid at the time and I just saw a lot of like back of the house behavior that I wasn't really, uh, I, I didn't know that if I, I didn't know I could control myself around, I knew that I could easily get drifted into some of the, the darker, um, the holes in the back of the kitchen. Um, a lot of drug use, a lot of alcohol use, a lot of stress and bad health. And so anyway, I just, you know, I kind of went in, I drifted in now, went to uh, college for um, communications, always had these ideas of what I wanted to do in terms of how I wanted to communicate, started a podcast, kind of just, just going through all the stuff. And my wife, she's a, she's a big foodie too. You know, she's, she, you know, she follows everything that's going on with the, the inner workings of the Portland food scene. And uh, she's made some good connections. So we said, well, you know, let's uh, I have a, you know, master's in multimedia journalism. I make videos. She loves to eat good food. So do I. So and, you know, she's good. At, we're both good at meeting people. So we thought, let's get out there and just and make this um, web series, essentially what we're doing. And what it is, is it's a, it's, we're trying to tell the story of how Portland has recovered from the events of the last 17 months through the eyes of the food industry. 
I love it. I love it, man. And um, how, like, what, what, I mean, if you kind of just, I don't, I don't want to give anything away, but like, what are some of the stories that you've like, I guess, give me like top two, like of, I mean, I'm, I'm, there's gotta be a lot of inspirational stories that have come out of that because people really had to adapt and a lot of cases alter their, their business models to survive. So is there anything you could speak to? Well, and, you know, it's funny you ask that because I'm actually in the second phase of putting this together, um, trying to figure out what the right questions to ask people are. Uh, get away from necessarily making these showcase pieces about each restaurant and really trying to dive into like how each place got sort of creative um, and either lost their business or, you know, have survived in some creative way. And to be honest with you, I haven't, there's, there's not a lot that's like mind blowing in terms of story yet. Uh, I think that I need to weave some things together, but you know, there's this place called Mama Chow's Noodle House in downtown Portland, and they're just a favorite of ours. And if you haven't been there, I highly recommend them. Um, on. You know, the guy, uh, I always thought the lady at the front counter was Mama Chow. It's not. It's a friend of the guy that works in the back. And the guy that works in the back is the owner. And his mom recently uh, passed away. That's Mama Chow. And... Mm. Between that happening and COVID and them being downtown, um, they're like right there experiencing as, I mean, as vulnerable as you can be in the middle of all these protests and, you know, and, and the nights when they were truly riots, um, the growing um, population of people experiencing homelessness downtown is, uh, you know, affecting everything. So they're right there in the middle of it. And I mean, there were definitely some tears coming from that uh, interview and it felt really good to be uh, somebody that they allowed to come in and talk to them. Uh, and, and they were willing to um, share their emotions like that. So, um, you know, there's not a, trying to figure out how to frame some of these stories, but at the moment, yeah, it's just trying to get in there and trying to talk to people about you. Cause at the end of the day, Portland on the, you know, if you look at, Fox News or any of the mainstream media, Portland is this war zone or was this war zone forever. I lived right next mm -hmm. to downtown Portland. There was like six square blocks of, you know, craziness. Chaos, Chaos. pandemonium. Yeah. And then you have the growing, you know, tent thing in Old Town. But I, my fa I never felt unsafe. My family never felt unsafe. We'd be re living right next to downtown. And at the end of the day, I just want to showcase the fact that, uh, the, any city is just a bunch of people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's not one thing. And it's not just one Mecca of liberal nonsense. It's not a Mecca of homelessness. It's not a Mecca of, you know, Antifa's. It's a lot of different things. And that's what I think the, the restaurant scene just kind of showcases as well. That's a, I think that that's really what this documentary is about i think it's it's food you're you're trying to use food to tell a story i, I mean shit this this is almost like a meeting of the minds which is you know i love I, th I think that it's i think that that's what it's about that's the ethos and that's going to be hard to to really tease out especially where are you in the where are you in the process of making this documentary your early i know you have a shit ton of footage I know that you do. Are you just editing and slapping it together? Or is there more filming to be done? Well, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I started the process when I was, my primary thing was freelance. There wasn't a lot of freelance during COVID. And then right after I started filming, I got all these interviews booked. <laughs> um, I, I picked up a full-time job. So it kind of put some things on the, uh, uh, you know, made things a little bit more difficult to get out there uh, with scheduling and things. But I've restructured it in such a way to where it's going to be a lot easier, uh, kind of solidified the plans this last weekend as far, as far as how we're going to get out there. We're going to take a little bit of pressure off ourselves in terms of, you know, um, the, the production value. We're a very small crew. Oftentimes it's just one or two of us. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we're going to essentially just change, give ourselves a little bit of a break and get in there and, and, find the story and not worry as much about like, do we have enough microphones set up? Do we have enough lights set up? Do we have enough cameras on this thing? Yeah. Yeah. That's that. I think that that's the move, man. That's the move. I, um, I was actually reading a, I'm, I'm almost finished with this book on 
General George S. Patton. And um, I wanted, like, I think what you're trying to do right now, and I gotta, I gotta find that quote. I, I definitely wrote it down, uh, and I'll, I'll share it with you in just a minute when I find it. But basically, it's like, okay, here it is. War is not about perfection, which is timeless. It is about the opportunity, which is chained to time. The best is the enemy of the good. It is always better to execute a good plan violently and immediately than it is to sacrifice fleeting opportunities by waiting for perfection. And I feel like sometimes during our meeting of the minds, you would get bogged up, bogged down in like, I want things to be perfect. Like when you're on vacation, I want to shoot stuff. And sometimes we'd talk and you'd be like, you know what? Or you, we'd get to a place where, you know, you know what? I'm just going to say, fuck it. I'm going to relax. And when I have time to film, I'll film. And what I, I mean, the best thing that, that I'd like to share with you is like, uh, you attack with what you have when you have it. And that's exactly what you're doing. And when you, when you, I'm hearing you talk like that, that's, that's when I know you'll find that gold, you know, it's got to be spontaneous. It's and and I can't, I can't wait to see this thing. Where, where's, where can I, where can I watch it? Well, I think you're, I think at the end of the day, you're probably going to end up seeing it on YouTube first. It's Fuck probably yeah. going to end up um, being a, uh, essentially distributed the same way a vlog is at first until I can mm -hmm. get some, um, you know, I'd like to get some direct sponsorship. I don't want to go, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to become a vlogger. I don't want to seek no. um, views in that way. Like I, I'd rather just grow, grow my craft and tell good stories. Um, as pretentious as that might sound, it's true. And it, if I never make money at multimedia stuff at the end of the day, I at least want to have a body of work that, that, um, that makes it all worth it. Right. It's, Oh yeah. It's, yeah. So, but if, you know, but if this thing becomes something and there are a couple organizations that want to pick it up and, and, uh, help throw some money at it to get a bigger production crew to help me get a writing staff and to help me get some editors on board, you know, we could, I can move this thing a little faster, but at the time being it's, um, it's mostly, uh, you know, two man band. And, uh, anyway, um, I, you know, I, I feel like, uh, it's when I'm going into stuff like this, I'm finding reasons to give myself excuses not to perform as well as I could. Um, and I think it was atomic habits. I don't know if you've read that book. Um, I definitely, Oh no, I, I have it. It's on my to-do list. I, I own it. I just haven't read it yet. So yeah. I mean, it's an audible, right? Like mm -hmm. you can listen to it while you're working out. It's great. Um, mm -hmm. but I think it was in, in that book that they said, they just, it was a reminder quantity over quality. Like it's, there was a, there was a study done that, uh, and I'm going to butcher the study a little bit probably, but, um, they studied the, it was a photography class and he took half the class, the professor took half the class and said, um, we want you to take one photo. That, that's your, that's your assignment for the whole term is to take the perfect photo. The assignment for the other half of the class is we want you to take as many photos as possible. And the class, the side of the class that took as many photos as possible came out with far better photos than the side of the class that kept their assignment was one great photo. Um, they didn't mm -hmm. even come close. The side that took the most photos had just way better photos. So 100% repetition is the definition of success. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's that simple. I mean, yeah, uh, to that point, one of the things that I've realized about myself recently, because I mean, I think, sorry, the listeners, I, I, I was in flux. I just, I transitioned careers, made a massive change. But one of the things that I've learned, um, and this, I think like this is like just me getting older and more comfortable in my own skin, is that I used to be so afraid to make a move that it would paralyze me. And now I don't give a fuck. Like, I'm just like, I, I immediately know I'm going to fail. I'm going to make mistakes, but I'm going to learn. And once I had that drilled into my brain, everything kind of just opened up for me because I wasn't, I, I wasn't afraid anymore. And then I read 10 X by Grant Cardone. That's a great book. I'd recommend anyone. It's you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it but it just talks about massive action. 
and doing massive action, throwing yourself full force into something and just going after it. And you're going to fuck up, but that's okay. That's part of the process. I mean, these, I mean, I, I'm a self help addict, man. I, anything about self improvement, I'm all about because I want to be, I'm going to try to be the best version of myself. Have you had a chance to read Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art yet? I, it's no, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's been. Did on you my have list to read that? Years. And I'm not going to lie, I haven't even read it yet. <laughs> I haven't even read it yet. He's <laughs> read the. <laughs> no, I've, I've got the Sparks Notes version. Sparks Notes. I'm gonna read it. No, I'm I'm gonna read. That's I want. I normally listen to a lot of books, but like I'm fucking reading that. It's a short read, but my one of my best friends, Scott, he's read it several times, and like we have a form where we've been writing in it for I don't know, geez, like four years now. It's over a thousand pages, just kind of like a living journal. And he, the, some of the things I've learned from him off of that is like the resistance and it's that little voice with a capital r resistance like it's that little voice that tells you oh like oh you're tired you don't want to do this or, or and it and it and his and his theory of it is it adapts and evolves so as you get better the resistance gets better and and it's scary cuz i've definitely that's definitely true to me cuz the resist the way it attacks me that that the the worst I, the the laziness whatever like the way it attacks me now is much different like it used to be it was like oh why don't you just watch tv all day like you don't have shit to do and i would do it but now it's like if i'm being productive or i'm crushing it's like oh man you've done a lot today and you've got like you know four things left to do like why don't you just why don't you just call it a day or why don't you sleep in a little bit longer i mean i feel like you know, if you don't get out of bed when you're supposed to, like you've ar- you've already failed. That, that's the first decision you make every day. That's the first battle that you have every day is whether to get up or to sleep in. And if you lose that battle, it sets the tone for the rest of the day. Yep, I get up at that's five fucking- every day, and it those days. I mean, you know, there's occasional days like mm-hmm. if I. If my kid was up all night sick, I might, you know, let myself skip the gym on a Tuesday and go on Wednesday instead. But, you know, it's for the most part. Yeah, 5 a.m. I'm yeah. up. I've got a routine. My routines on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday when I hit, go to the gym are different than my routines on Tuesday and Thursday, which I go for a run. Um, and I just I have it set up. And uh, and then I just pack my day every day. Um, and it's nice. It's, I, you it know, is. being in college, I, I, every term that I would take like eight credits, I'd shit the bed, you know, yep. every, every term that I took 16 or 20 credits and was working a job, you know, for a part-time job, I was, I'd knock it out of the park. It's like, yep. it leaves less room for failure. It forces you into a position where you have to get your shit together. And I like, I like being busy overall. And actually during COVID, that was a, that was a motherfucker because you know, I was just coming out of grad school, getting my my freelance thing off the ground and really just hoping to just kill this thing. And then I had a great contracted job going with a nonprofit group in Portland telling stories that I want to tell, using my skills. And then COVID comes in one week before my contract ends and kicks the heels out from underneath that whole thing. Nobody was hiring for video, right? Uh, mm-hmm. for, for ancillary businesses. They weren't hiring for extra stuff at that point. They're just trying to keep their doors open, and their lights on. So um, I became a stay at home dad. You know, my kids were out of daycare uh, for a while. And I cannot tell you how m- foggy things got. Like they got things got slippery real quick in terms of just my ability to, to find any sort of cr- ounce of creative anything in my mind. Uh, and then, you know, I saw this job, my, my wife actually sent me the link to it and I was like, you know, it's for, it's for a religious organization. And, uh, as you know, that's far from who I am, but <laughs> I was like, really hun? And she was like, yeah, you know, you should, you should at least try it out. It doesn't pay that well. And it doesn't, you know, it's not really your thing, but, uh, it's a job and it's real close to where we live. So I applied and I got the job and sure enough, like having to be somewhere and having deadlines it just completely like 180 because i was going to actually challenge you on the fact like you know i'm not you're making money making telling stories they're just not the stories you want to tell right and you know what's great about it too? So you're you're making and it and it's also forcing you 
to look at something from a viewpoint that you wouldn't see and be more persuasive. So it's going to make you a better storyteller, right? Like there, like, like there is like the universe is strange where it's like, it's opening the door for you and it's, it's getting you even deeper into film, deeper into editing. And it's, it's a, I mean, it's a blessing, like plain and simple, like you are making money in multimedia right now. You have a fucking job. How many people do you know that can say that? Not very many. Right. And it's the first time in my entire life, of, you know, since I've started doing this, that I have had to produce five to 10 videos in a month. You know, I've never had that sort of pressure on me where I had to actually learn how to get my pipelines together and produce. And I thought about it like this, like, okay, if I have this story that I need to tell on campus, which doesn't really inspire me at all, but I need to make it inspirational for their audience. Um, it makes me think like, you know, the, the HVAC company that might hire me to make a video for them. Like I'm not inspired by HVAC. I, you know, I th think it's cool, but um, I'm glad that they, uh, they, they exist, but I'm not inspired by them, but I need to make a video for that client. That's going to, you know, inspire the world. Or if somebody picks me up and says, Hey, we need, we want to follow you around, or we want you to follow us around with a camera, or we want you to make a documentary about the subject. And if the subject's not really something that I'm super passionate about, um, but I need to tell the story, then I need to, you know, I need to know how to turn that part of myself on as well. You know, and I think that's yep. part of the creative process is not everything you do. I, I almost think it's a fool's uh, errand to, to assume that you're going to be able to find something that every part of it is something that you're passionate about. And I think that that's a luxury that, that our generation has, um, you know, kind of been sort of duped by in a way. Yeah, I, I would, I would definitely agree with you in that notion, right? Like, it, there's a benefit because you're becoming, you're honing your craft, and you're honing, you're going to be forced to hone your craft in different ways. But you never know, like maybe f filming for an HVAC company and shortcut, like it'll end up being like, you know what? There's something interesting about this, and I'm going to add this twist to the way I make films, and it's going to make me unique. It's going to make me different. It's going to make me more well-rounded, right? Like I think that that's the mark of any, anybody that's a master at anything is they've done so much shit that they know everything. And, um, I, you know, that's, and that's, that's, that's where you're on. That's where you are right now. You're on a path, right? Like you're on a path and you're, you're walking and you're walking slow, but you're actually still making progress. It's not as fast as you'd want it to be. Like Never. nothing in my life. Yeah. No. And that's the thing I've talked to numerous friends about starting businesses, whatever. Um, nothing that we've ever thought we wanted to do or attempted to do has ever turned out the way we wanted it to. It, it always happens. It's just not in the way that you think it's going to happen. Some things things happen super fast. Generally speaking, that has never been my experience. It always has taken way fucking longer than I've wanted it to take. But every now and again, something happens really, really quickly. I'm due for something to happen quick, though. God damn it. I'm fucking due, man. I want it to happen. Well, so man, you're fast. putting in, I mean, you're, you're putting in the, the hours, man. You're, 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 you're on your way to your 10,000 hours. You know, you're just, you're really yeah. doing it. And, and, uh, I've seen growth in your interview style. Um, I've seen your. I've seen growth. I'm gonna. I'm gonna um, pat you on the back a little bit if you don't mind. Um, I listened to your podcast. I forgive me for forgetting the guy's name, but it was the environmentalist conversation or the environmental. Oh, Kyle. Kyle Topher. Great, great conversation. That guy was really uh, a great guest, and you facilitated that great. And and one thing I liked and. Um, I hope this is a compliment, but in earlier podcasts where you might not catch yourself uh, drifting, you'll almost like you, you stay on something just long enough to be able to turn the corner and give it back to them. And you, you're really, I think you've really honed your craft in terms of being able to provide space for your guests and just set up for the next question. Um, as opposed to trying to be the expert of all things, because right. Your, your, your craft is not to be a, a nuclear physicist or, uh, you know, um, whatever biologist, your craft is an interviewer. 
And you yeah. want to find the stories to, to help help hopefully you know plant some seeds of of wisdom and and curiosity in your listeners. So I think you, that if that is who you're trying to become, then yes. I think you're fucking getting way better at it. That's that's definitely who I'm becoming. And I think uh, in the early and I, and again, I want to just make this very clear. I still fucking suck at this. We're we're not even to sixty episodes. And we have a lot more to do. We've got thousands more to make. But like in the earlier stages, I think a bit of it was ego and fear and maybe not taking it as seriously and not, and also not being as well read. Like reading has kind of opened up a lot of, a lot of things and different tones. And, and <laughs> you hear that? Yeah. You've got dissension in the ranks, my friend. There, there are children creeping about now. Now it's all good, man. Oh, but, um, it's gonna, I, I thought I had, uh, some space here. No, you're good, dude. You're good. Is this, um, do you record this on video too? No, no, we don't record it on video yet. We're going to be, uh, live in video and probably about, uh, gosh, I mean, honestly, we're like five said episodes episode away. Episode sixty, I think. So, yeah. Episode, yeah, yeah. Episode six. I don't even know what episode we're on. Episode 56, sixty. We're gonna go to. This will yeah, be 56. yeah, fifty-six. So yeah, we got four fun, more to go, and then because we got a YouTube channel, uh, we just got a new team mem- member that's gonna kind of be handling social media and whatnot, and um, we're we're getting more organized. We have someone that is gonna be more organized so we've got like an administrative type human that is a different brain than than mine or demarco's so but um back to what i was saying yeah yeah, any and ego man like ego probably not wanting to know like because i mean i feel like i'm a pretty smart person but like i honestly don't know i don't know shit really don't i think that's such a good place to start though um because, you know, and we talked about this, I, I think maybe the reason we talked about this when we first started, I don't even know if we were recording yet or not, but why I'm even here. And I think, um, you know, not, not only are we uh, literally related, but uh, mm-hmm. we are, we've always drifted back um, with similar interests in some facet or another. And lately, I think, you know, we've been a very loose meeting of the minds, you know, we have a conversation once in a while, well, uh, you know, about what we're doing, but um, I, you know, I've been doing a little bit of writing here and there, and that's kind of the premise of what I've been writing. But the only thing I really want to write about is, uh, the idea of, of like, there's a problem with certainty, I think in the world. I think that's the, I think if I can, if I can put one word on the world's problem, or at least America's problems, it's, uh, certainty. And I think being able to admit that you're not an expert and also, you know, if you're an excellent snowmobile mechanic, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be an excellent, you're going to be excellent at gauging whether or not a vaccine is good for you. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like that's, yeah, you should, you, you should, it's okay for you to be, you know what I mean? If I go online and I, and I look up snowmobile engine, how to build a snowmobile engine. And I study it for two hours that does not arm me with the proper, uh, education to be able to go build a snowmobile snowmobile engine. Um, and I think that that's where the trouble we get into sometimes is we, it's myself included, you know, um, there's a humility, a lack of humility, I think. And I think that that's what you are. I think that that's what has made you, you have a tone of humility. I think that's, that's, um, that you've been sort of massaging over the years. Every once in a while, I'll tune into one of your podcasts and I'm like, Oh, he's, he's, uh, he's finding his voice. Yeah, man. It's all about, you know, finding my voice and trying to speak my truth. I mean, really what I want anyone that listens to the show to know is that, Nothing is is nothing is as it seems, and there is so much fucking mystery into this world and this life, and that really, I believe that you get exactly what you want out of life. Generally, that's my rule. 
That's just my own little. I've got a lot of weird things that float around in my head, and I also like a little bit of woo woo. I think a woo woo is a little bit important, right? Fun. Fun. But I think if you work hard and you strive, I mean, and you surround yourself. This is very, very crucial. If you surround yourself with the right people, you'll at least be average. So if you only surround yourself with millionaires, you'll probably end up being a millionaire because you'll be average. You might not be the richest person, but at least you'll be average. Right. Cause I mean, even in my friend, my circle, my sphere, like, and that's another thing. The whole, I mean, honestly, sorry, motherfuckers, this podcast is selfish. I want to talk to people. Mm. I want to talk to everybody because I get smarter when I talk to people. I, I get smarter and I want them in my circle. I want to be able to text. I got a guy, if something goes on in Cuba, I can text him. I mean, really, but. It came from me being jealous from Joe Rogan and Tim Ferriss and all the other podcasters. I'm like, if they're curious or they want to know something, they literally have thousands of people that they can talk to and find an answer. You know, um, if I if I want to talk if I want to know about China, I, I text I'll text Laszlo. If I want to know anything about Cuba, I'll text my buddy in New York. Want to know something about for time? Damn it, I forgot his Nick. Nick Ramos. I'm sorry, brother. Shout out. Shout out to Nick Ramos. <laughs> I almost, man, that's not good. Let's cut that out. <laughs> oh, dude, that was sketch. Uh, yeah, it's such a good place to be in, you know, to be a trusted voice. I mean, you know, you take you take some of these guys and, you know, they're the center of it all. So, of course, they're going to be they're going to have more um, more of a bullseye on their back. Um, which, you know, Tim Ferriss is pretty good at dodging the, you know, not having a bullseye on his back, but Joe Rogan's, you know, throwing one on his back all the time, but he's got guys like, you know, Cameron Haynes and what's the meat eater guy, right? You know, like, Steve Rinella, Steve Steve Rinella, Rinella, yeah. I mean, these are incredible humans that he gets to sit down and talk to. And I, yeah, I, I know what you mean. And, but you know, the, the thing though is, and, and I'm not, I don't mean to be negative here. Uh, drifting back to the this this uh, certainty thing, but that's that's actually I think that's actually what you're saying. Uh, learning through conversation is not something that's just inherently like built into us. I don't, don't think, think so. No, not at all. I think that so really? many people, especially if you stay in your tribe, especially if you stay oh. like if you surround yourself with enough of the same people that are thinking these things that don't, and none of them are elevated. You can talk, you can talk circles of these people all day long. You're never going to get any smarter. All you're going to learn is how to talk more like them. It's like you can tune into, you know, Fox news or, you know, CNN or whatever, every all day long. And, you know, and you might get a little bit more informed, but really what you're going to really get good at is talking more like the guys you're listening to. I think. Yes, I actually agree with you. And I think that that was the most magical thing. Uh, I've told this story on the podcast before too, like, like in regards to COVID was that was a COVID was the best thing that ever happened to me. I journeyed within instead of going out, I journeyed within and I worked on myself and I, and when George Floyd happened, I was very confused. I was hurt. And I was very confused. And so I picked up Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom, Audible Bitches, listened to Audible. And I listened to it. I didn't really listen to it. And it answered all every question I had. And I saw a man with conviction uh, who was honest and was a terrorist at one point, like legit, like got locked up. Never, I don't think he ever hurt people. He, he hurt like objective objectives, like power plants and different things for the apartheid government. Um, but that's what he was doing. He, he finally got violent at the end and then went away for 20 years and then formed an organization, a political organization in prison. And that's a man that was a man of conviction. And that's a man that I would follow. Uh, and I read, I think, a, a, a book on MLK. I don't remember the name. I also read one on um, a autobiography on uh, Malcolm X. And these are all men, probably not Malcolm because he was in kind of a cult, but you know, that's, that's neither here nor there. But like these are men that I would follow and that were men of conviction, right? Well, Malcolm was a man of conviction late later stages. And in the movement that I saw, I didn't see anyone that was 
people of conviction. I don't, I didn't even know, I know it's a decentralized organization, but I just didn't see that. With and that kind of scared me. With like the Black Lives Matter, I didn't see, like it's a decentralized organization, but I also feel like like the, the, the leader of it's like a trained Marxist and about a how, like there, I didn't see that same level of dedication and sacrifice and like very clear, like a very clear messaging. I thought the rhetoric was off. You know, there are certain things that, yeah, we can all agree on, but I didn't like that. Right. And I also, so I stayed away, but anyways, I'm off topic. I'm on a rant oh, now. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm but I journeyed within man. Yeah. I, I journeyed within and I realized that the only thing that you can do is you can change yourself. And I've said this a million times. You can only control a few things in life. You control your attitude, your effort, and what you put in your body. And if you can control those three things, and there's probably more, I'm missing some, but you're off to a better start than most people. You really are. And I think that another another problem, you, you mentioned a problem of um, ego and... Um, people wanting to be experts. And I would challenge that. I think another problem that we have as a species is personal responsibility and taking ownership of your life. I really do. I think that I feel like right now, I feel like there is a culture being pushed of like victimhood. I feel like there is because just because of the color of my skin people and i and i'm not going to say that i had i'll also say this i do and understand that i do have a certain amount of, i had two parents that loved each other which is rare and i had a, a good family this, you know you can agree it's kind of fucked up but a good family for the most part right and um i think that people telling me that i'm screwed just because i'm black is insane and i don't look at it like that and I don't, I want, you know, all the brothers and sisters listening to know that like, if you look at your life and you say being black is the best thing that ever happened to me, I have all the advantages in the world and I'm going to go after it. If one door closes, I'll fucking break down 10 more. That's how I have to live my life. That's the only way for me. And I hope that that's, you know, that's my message, right? So can I, I, I um, if I may, white explain a white man explain to a black man really quick. Please white explain this. Please <laughs> white explain this to me. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I thought a lot about this because you know I'm I'm a white, you know, cis male living pretty, you know, a pretty comfortable life, and uh, so it's hard. It's really difficult, and it, it, whatever difficult, you know. Again, poor me, but I. I remember years ago, I got really into like nutrition, like the paleo, this, the paleo stuff. And I, you know, I still, you know, adhere to that for the most part, but I, um, I got to thinking about the, you know, 350 pound guy sitting on his couch and, and people saying like, Oh, that guy should just get off of his ass and go do it. Stop feeling sorry for himself. And then I got yeah. to thinking like, the effort that it takes that man just to walk to the fridge is so much more than it takes for me to go do a, a chest workout. You know what I mean? Like that guy, that guy has got to put so much more effort into every little thing and it, it's got to feel all for nothing. Right. Like I, I go to the gym and I'm like, God, why am I not developing? Why am I not? Why is my chest not bigger? Why are my arms not bigger? Why? Why is this? Why is this? Why am I so soft in the cage? But I can't imagine what that would be for, like, for a thirty, you know, three hundred fifty pound guy, uh, or, or anybody who's like spent their whole lives eating a certain type of food, and the people around them uh, have kind of allowed this to happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. It's just it just seems like so much more complex than that to me. And I've seen white people too that are just, you know, they're, they have all the, you know, so, so I, I, my, my point is that in my experience, human beings oftentimes, uh, some find an outlet or find, find an excuse as to why they can't do things. And sometimes that excuse is just culturally inherent in who they are. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, if they don't know, like, okay, if they get, if they, 
if their entire family smokes and they're handed a pack of cigarettes at 12 years old and they start smoking and they're eating just garbage food every single day. And like, what, what do we expect them at some point to just like get like become a, you know, like super healthy person and start crossfitting. And like, if they do, they're the exception to the rule. And so that's when I think about, you know, with the black lives matter movement, it's one of the things that kind of, I think it shined a light on for me anyway, was just, I have no fucking idea what it's like to be in the life, in the, in the skin of anybody else, specifically with that movement, uh, people of color. Um, and so I tried to be really like empathetic to it. The problem that I had, and this is where I'll get a little opinionated is the white people coming after you know, making me attacks on behalf. Like it was, it just, I'm, I'm a, I'm a left leaning. I'm a, you know, you know me, I'm Mm -hmm. liberal. I've been my Mm -hmm. whole life. I've been called radical at times, but the, the, Mm -hmm. this, these last 17 months have really exposed a, uh, for lack of a better term, wokeness that I'm really just, that's what I'm struggling yes. with. And when you were saying that. Yes. Here, take the, take, take the pill, brother. <laughs> and you were saying the other day, or when you said earlier in this conversation, you said, uh, you know, the one, one of the things that I'm worried about, or you, uh, I, what I thought you were going to say is that you were going to say something on record that you were going to be later scrutinized for. Um, I I don't know how much I want to go off on this. I've been absolutely disappointed by white l- far left liberals that I once was felt like I was like that was my my tribe. Oh, and dude, I was just I like am, and it still is, is like at the, at the core value of what it was before I'd say before the Bernie Sanders campaign what it was before that was a set of like ideals and objectives that we try to work w- work through and we try to achieve by talking to people and having structured conversations where if i disagree with you if i disagree with you we can still be friends and you're not a fucking nazi you're not you know a racist you're not transphobic you're not this you're not that they're weaponizing these insults and you're not, that's not conducive to healthy discourse. And if we can't agree on truth, if we can't have discourse, then the other, then the only alternative is fucking violence. So we're at a very scary place. And verbal violence and like yes. violence to the point where you want to take people's jobs away because of something they yes. said 15 years ago, because of something they said while they were like still living at their parents' house and going to high school. It's like, Yes, we got to we got to provide some grace for each other. And if and if, you know, as as an atheist, if we're going to learn anything from like, you know, Judeo Christian values, it's providing grace for each other because, you know, we got to give each other a little space for uh, we can call it error. We got to give each other a little space for uh, the growing process. Where are you now? Maybe you're just on a journey. Maybe something's different is going to happen for you down the road, and you're going to look back, and your position might change on something that you're saying. And and I just feel like come to your come to your place, and yeah. don't ridicule those who aren't in the same place as you at that specific time, especially. And this can go for both. I mean, this can go. I mean, we can go deep into the fucking like QAnon, like election was stolen shit. But like you, if, if you can, if you can pinpoint a place in time where your thoughts became trendy, then you should probably question your thoughts. If your positions were all of a sudden mass, the mass opinion, you should probably really question your own positions. Dude. Oh my God, that's a great fucking clip right there. I, I'm first off, I'm glad we're recording this conversation because if this would have been like five years ago, I don't think you would have ever said any of these things. But that's just a testament to how bad it's gotten. Another thing I want to get to while we're on this is, dude, we got to do something about um, the like homelessness and the open drug scenes that are going on. 
Like I am all pro like legalize all drugs and whatnot. But at the same time, like a society is essentially carrots and sticks, right? Like your our carrot and being in, you know, gangfully employed is like, Oh, you do really well. You make money and that's great. And this is why you're going to keep, this is your incentive. But if you can't, like if there is no incentive for you to fucking not be homeless and to take drugs, like I've literally was in downtown Portland and saw a guy with a heroin needle sticking out of his fucking veins. That's not okay. No, that's, that's, that's unacceptable. And we, that they're break. It's breaking a social contract that we all have. And it's, and it's something that we have to do. And the wokeness, it's like, no, 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 no. That's not healthy for anybody. That's not that healthy is not, for we, them. No, it's not healthy for them. It's not healthy for us. It's not healthy for the city. It's not healthy for, it's not healthy. It's dangerous. And, you know, another problem in these homeless camps are, are people are getting raped. People are getting murdered and no one gives a fuck. We can't have that. Yeah. We have to have law and order because if law and order breaks down, then your ideologies are fucked. And the other side, whatever, you know, they have all the guns and, they, you know, we got to have, we got to have law and order. And we can't continue to like, obviously, you know, the idea of like defunding the police, that's, that's fucking stupid. We need more of them. And I just was listening to a conversation and I, um, the, his name escapes me, but he woke like, and he still is, he's not woke, but he's like left super left. And, but he's one of those guys that actually traveled to the Netherlands and he has traveled to Portugal and he asked them, like, so you decriminalize drugs? What would happen if someone was using heroin? Like, they would go to jail, of course. Like, we, It's just, if they have more than the amount, they would go to jail. Like, you can't just open up our society to lawlessness. So he equates where we are in Portland, primarily on the West Coast, right? I'm sure it's everywhere, but I'm just going to speak to the West Coast because I've been to all the West Coast cities, right? Is that we're where the Netherlands were like 30 years ago. And we need to evolve and we need to have, we need to bring the stick back and we need to, and he's like, even homelessness, that's a, that's a form of propaganda. He said in Europe, they refer to them as open drug scenes and that's exactly what they are. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I, I'm also worried about that because they're also like, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. There also has to be personal accountability we need we need people to be accountable for themselves and we need them to get better because how much intellectual capital is wasted and how much on the streets like you know i don't know i can't equate it but these need to be productive members in our tribe in our society right cuz we're all in this together and us not doing anything about it is terrible and I mean, this guy, and I'll, I'll find his name in a minute, but he, right now he's known as the dude. This dude is, he has a plan. First guy, I'm going to read his book. Um, and his plan is to have this taken care of at the state level. Now the libertarian means like, Oh God, the government, but it's like, there needs to be, it needs to be done by the state. He, he spoke of people going to different counties, right? Because it's a transient population. And some of them, like let's say use California, they'd have an apartment or shelter in San Francisco and then shelter in, in Los Angeles because they, they move around. And he's like, we need to be able to keep track account of them and have like a point of contact that is figuring out where they're going because we're wasting money in that case. Um, I think that that's a good, it's the first person that, you know, I've heard of that actually has a plan to take care of this. The good dude's name is Michael Schellenberger. So I'm going to be reading that book because the I, I've been trying to get somebody on the podcast that deals with the homeless. And I want to read that book before. And when I say read, I mean, listen, that's the cheat code to life, everyone. If you haven't picked up on that by now, you just need to listen to books. Um, uh, but... I want to read that book and then get someone on the podcast and talk about the homeless situation. Cause it's definitely out of hand and it's, it's really sad to see. Well, I think one of the things, and I think that that situation is one of those prime examples of uh, there's not a one answer 
for it, right? The no, no, I don't think any one person has the answer. You know, I've, I've had conversations with people recently where I thought, you know, wouldn't it be incredible if like some staunch Republican became the governor of Oregon and then like a moderate, like right leaning person won the mayorship in Oregon? Like the homeless thing probably would be cleaned up pretty quick. Like I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not, and I'm a Democrat. I'm saying that oh the only God. problem is, is that would probably turn into 40 years of Republican run Oregon. So I'm kind of afraid of that happening. Wait, 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 dude. I, I, what the fuck happened to you? I yeah. love this. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, but I've, I've known you my entire life and I've never heard you talk this way. And and, and it's fucking tasty, dude. Uh, I love, you this. know, no, just, just, just bear with me though, because I'm, I fucking can't stand the Republican party. I, I know I, I'm so annoyed by it and I'm not, tr- I'm not defending. I'm Republican. I just saying like, you know, maybe we need a little bit of balance. We haven't been read in like 30 years. It's true. I, what, what I don't like, what I, I, I think that it's just to me, there's not, there's no sense. And have in in providing a society in which people can have which people have tents running up and down the freeways the and the and underpasses and all the way through the cities of people who are trying to run businesses in order to bring tax revenue into the city bring tourism into the city and then you you push that tourism and that tax revenue away which provides the the resources for this population, uh, but by you know, family comes down to try voodoo donuts and they see someone with a, a needle in their arm. And, you know, like how it, this can't be good. And also providing a, a, a space for the person to be able to put a needle in their arm on the side of the road. Like I don't see who this is serving, and it seems to me what we're doing is for the sake of feelings. And uh, not being afraid to say the wrong thing to hurt people, it, 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 whatever and whatever language um, expectations we have at this current time in our life, we're fucking a lot of people over. And that doesn't mean just the business owners. That doesn't mean just the people who want to enjoy Portland. That also means the people who this we need to help. And I don't know that, like you said, I don't know that it's a thing where some people say, Oh, we need more, we need cheaper housing or we need more social services. Do we, I don't, I don't know. That's the thing. No, it's, it's not the thing It's that's definitely not the thing. Show me the metrics that works. If you look at California, they, it's not a money problem. I thought it was a money problem. No, they throw people are making millions of dollars trying to deal with the homeless. It's because nothing is really getting done and there's no sticks. Like in California, I'm not sure if this is a case in Oregon, but in California, you, I could go into Walmart or Target and steal under $950 of shit and get away with it. That's bullshit. That's not okay. Like we, like we've gone too far. And it, and the fact that you, someone that is very liberal, and still are, you, you still are, but the fact that you are kind of acknowledging we've gone too far, and this isn't what you're, you dude, you're officially politically homeless right now, and I would extend an olive branch for you to, well, let's be real here, and I need to say this, just because I'm libertarians are fucking nuts too, they're a hundred percent, but I would extend an olive, you're too liberal. I, you can't come into the libertarian fold, but we're we're a joke, anyways. But uh, but you're politically homeless, and I think a lot of Democrats now are very politically homeless because they're like, I don't that we're we're politically they have not addressed this because actually doing shit, actually doing shit is not part of the party, right? It's I mean it it used to be right, but like actually addressing this, this isn't gonna get you. A wide. This isn't going to. This isn't going to promote your career. This isn't going to do anything. It's going to be good for the people, but it's not going to be good for you. And they don't give a fuck. And that's the problem. And it like this. This can't continue. Like I don't know what's going to happen, but it's not good. And there are 
there are, uh, there's a lot of history on this too. Like whether, I mean, but I don't know. It's, that's a complicated thing. I was going to tie this all into like what's going on internationally. And we've all, everyone that listens to the show already knows that, but um, I, we do have to take care of what's fighting goes. I don't know where this infighting goes. I don't know how, you know, I listened to, I listened to Bernie Sanders for, uh, I don't know, a decade on the Tom Hartman show. I don't know if you ever listened to the show. Tom Harmon's, I think he was originally out of Portland. He went over to RT. Uh, but they did this thing called Brunch with Bernie. And almost every Sunday, or it was every Sunday. And I would listen to Brunch with Bernie while I was working. And, or whatever. And driving around in my car, listening to the show on AM radio. Love Bernie Sanders. He came on the scene. He was good. I was like, I hope that guy runs for president one day. Until his campaign got deep. And I was like, He's attracting what he's attracting is not what I was hoping. He's attack. He's attracting people who have, I mean, not, not entirely, but he's attracting a lot of people who have no fucking political wherewithal. They have no understanding of what, uh, like how pol- politics or government or anything works, economics or anything like I've been, Dude, called, yeah. I've been called a vile human. Because of the fact that I own properties that I rent to people. And this is, this became a, uh, I I don't know. I don't know where, I just don't know where this goes. It's all or nothing. We got to have this or it's because what you're going to give us is Trump. If you keep this shit up, we are going to give us a fucking another round of Trump and you're going to give us a more eccentric version of that dude. Like we literally allowed a con man who lied constantly and didn't have a fucking clue as to anything he was talking about created a nonsensical cult on accident and that won the presidency because the left was too fucking busy by it eating its own head and over like and robbing this Bernie. Can, like and, maybe we should question this this defund the police concept. I, I right when I saw that started going up everywhere, I was like, "Well, this is going to give Donald Trump another fucking term." And I posted something about that, and somebody got on and said, "Hey, maybe you should let black people come up with their own sayings or some shit." And I was like, "Do you even know that a fucking black person wrote that? Like, <laughs> you're just a white fucking person, you're privileged ass, getting on social media telling me a liberal who's trying to like." Make sure that the guy who's not racist, that the guy who's not, I shouldn't say that. The, I'm trying to make sure that the guy who's not inciting racism and who's not like, not every Donald Trump supporter is a racist, but every racist is a Donald Trump supporter, right? You are giving this <laughs> fucking ammunition and you're, you're feeding, you're, and so I just was like, okay, I'm over this shit. Like, I'm just over this. We well, have to. We have to be more humble. Like we can't yeah. have everything we want. We can't be a bunch of fucking spoiled brats just because our parents fucking set us up with play dates our whole life and decided who our friends or our education or everything was going to be for us. And now it didn't all work out for us perfectly. So we're going to fucking blame everything in society for it. We, like get like learn something. Don't just learn how to say stuff that the people around you are saying. Learn stuff. Figure out solutions and work for solutions. Don't just learn how to be a better social media person. That's what's frustrating me about the left is we're going to lose. We're going to fucking lose everything. And QAnon's going to win. How does QAnon <laughs> get into the mix? How does QAnon even rise at all? The only reason there's room for QAnon is because I believe because the far left is because it seems so fucking absurd that they're like, we're not, dude. We're listening to these other fringe people. We're listening to this other podcast, these other YouTube videos, because Crystal Ball and whatever, Chank Ugar or whatever the fuck, Young Turks, they're going to just spout a bunch of nonsense every fucking week. I, I did. Uh, I Sorry. wish people, I can't wait. No, no, no. I wish that people could see my face because I am in total shock right now. I am in, I'm in complete well, I'm in euphoria. Number one, that's uh, that's how that I'm going to ex- describe this first. And number two, 
this is this is what a strange development you i've never heard you talk this way about the left i have this is shocking to me but I've always I love been it. an independent thinker, and that's what made me not you, like no, uh, right. I never liked, and that's what that's why I've that's why I've always loved you is because I, I, you you I have you have views. Sorry, you, I thought you, progressive you, meant I thought liberal meant by definition liberal, like uh, you know, allowing more ideas and accepting more ideas and trying to learn more about. Like, I thought that's what it was supposed to be. Well, it it is, and I want to I want to say this. The reason I've always loved you is because, and we've always been very, very close, is because we we have we're both very, very opinionated, and we both like I I tend to lean a little bit more conservative, and uh, way more liberty. We've always ad- agreed on drugs, right, and freedom, guns, awesomeness, yeah, uh, maybe a little less well, on guns, but <laughs> but uh, um, guns are but I I definitely. I want to say this and I've said this and even to some of them, I have some insane conservative fucking insane conservative friends. I love them to death. But the one thing I will say whenever they lips, this I said, stop because everyone that you're referring to is not a liberal. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, dude, the real liberals have moved way past every issue that you're bitching about. They're fucking overseas complaining about like Saudi Arabia and these people dying and the rainforest burning down. Like that's where that they're out there living their truth and get they're They've swallowed the red pill or whatever you want to say it. And they're like, like, oh, these corporations are fucked. And like, that's what they are. Those are the liberals, right? Those are the bleeding heart. Like, and I love those people. God, I love them. We need them. We need them now more than ever. But everything that you're talking about now, this what you're talking about isn't liberalism. It's it's almost like a weird form of like fascism, like tribalism, craziness, right? Like that's what you're referring to, right? They're they're not about expand, they're about like shutting things down and control and and anti-liberty i mean at least that's what it looks like to me right like that's what they're about and um i think but i also think that it's important to say that i think that it's a very small amount of people that are very loud online and i think but i mean i don't you know i don't know i i also know that like have you seen the new dave Chappelle special dude i have it on my list of things i wanted to talk to you about did, Did you, you watch it? Yes. Oh my god, I fucking loved it. I died. I I thought, you know, the first 20 minutes I was like, okay. This feels like, you know, pretty standard Chappelle. I don't laugh at all of his jokes. He doesn't, you know, I'm not And then about 30 or 40 minutes in, that kicked up into one of the best stand up specials I've ever seen in my life. I I feel like it did too. And uh, it was so I good. feel like cuz I thought I thought when he was like, I'm going all the way, you didn't realize it was fear because he knew what was coming. Like he knew what was coming. And I think like, to me, he can never do like Dave Chappelle's a huge influence. He's a, he's a hero of mine. Really. I've, I've I've loved this man. He can do no wrong. in my And I'm biased by the way. I want to say that Dave can do no wrong in my eyes. But what I, what I think it is the central thesis of that, is we all need to love each other. And I also love, you know, when you, people are calling him out and whatnot, and he knew it was going to happen. And he's especially like, I walked away from $50 million because of what I believed in. All right. And everyone called him crazy. Everyone persecuted him. I still loved him. I was just disappointed there wasn't going to be a season three of the show. And I understand that people might think that some of those jokes were mean spirited, but basically like comedy and other people are under attack. I've reached out to another one of my, my friends who I'm hoping to get on here. His name's Gavin. He actually works in politics and super left leaning all the right, you know? And I, I asked him what he thought of the special. I was like, I thought it was fucking hilarious. And he, he's very much in the same place that you are. And, and one of the things he said to me is um, <clears throat> he's like, the problem with our politics today is that we're electing people that are like the, 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 the smallest amount of people have the largest voice. And he said, our politicians are telling us what we want to hear and not do and not telling us what we need to hear. And it's like, it's a very scary place. 
And I mean, this guy's, I mean, he's like, let's turn Texas blue. Like he's, he's not, he's far like Democrat. You know, we disagree on quite a few things, but we agree on that. And, and he thought that some of the jokes were mean. And I think that's fair. I think it's fair if you think that some of those jokes are, are mean. But I think the whole central thesis of that is everyone, we're like, there's no, like, I'm not punching down. I'm just, I'm punching everybody. And wasn't that the whole thing? Like, it, it, you know, I, the way I've always viewed comedy, and this is, again, this is the way I, I feel like what made me a liberal, what made me a proud liberal my entire life is the fact the, the premise is free speech, free speech and equality, equity, you know, but like if we don't have that and now the right is running rampant with their free speech. I mean, they're, 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 if Donald Trump can say the shit that he said and get away, like they are now the free speech people, right? We're going to say whatever yep. we want. We're going to talk nonsense constantly and you know, whatever uh, they're going to do. And we can say whatever we want. And, and you liberals who are trying to censor us are making us so uncomfortable that we're going to fight back with more ridiculousness. And I think that that's just obviously what's going to happen. You know, if, uh, if you put, I heard a saying the other day, if you're, if you have a 17 year old and you're giving them an eight o'clock curfew on a Saturday night, uh, they're, the, they're likely to fucking break that curfew on a regular basis. If you give them a midnight curfew, they're probably more likely to, to, you know, conform or to, you know, mm -hmm. to abide, but obey, but they, uh, we, we were, I feel like the left is just losing its grips on free speech. And, and the reason, the thing I've always liked about comedy is because, you know, if I watch, uh, you know, Louis C.K., I don't know if you're allowed to say his name anymore. I love uh, him still. Dude, going to see him. Going to see him in two weeks. And I'm going to go see Tim Dillon this weekend. Dude, where? <laughs> uh, the new, the Newmark Theater, same one as Louis is coming into. Really? Yeah. He's coming to town. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. going to see Louis in Kansas City. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. Just, just some barbecue. Fuck yeah. It's for my birthday to see him. But, it, but yeah, so I watched something that he'd watch and there were moments where he would make me so uncomfortable just with his jokes, oh, yeah. right? Or I'd be sitting mm -hmm. next, I remember I was sitting in a theater and my, uh, I, I shouldn't say who, uh, person I know uh, struggles with uh, mental illness and suicide and PTSD mm -hmm. and stuff. Another friend of mine that I was with there, uh, they just got into a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting through these jokes and Louis CK had this joke for like, and he went on for like 20 minutes about like you don't have to do anything because you, you could just kill yourself, kill yourself. right <laughs> I, I remember this, the yeah this is before the special came out and i was just sitting there i was just like and i was thinking about the person that's a couple <laughs> seats away from me and i'm like oh my god and he just kept saying it and saying it and i was like oh my god how many ways is he gonna just killing yourself <laughs> and then people to my left you know they just got into a relationship and they were you know working through things and he's just saying like basically the beginning of this thing is as good as it gets at all it's yeah it from here and i'm just like i i want to be made uncomfortable like uh yes. the thing and you know uh, popped up on my youtube for some reason dave shapiro with adam carolla they were having a, a conversation about a comedy special that dave Shap uh, i'm sorry is it Ben Shapiro? Shapiro. I don't know why I said okay. so Ben Shapiro. He's he made a good point, and he does at times. I, I'm not a fan, but no, you it, hate you fucking hate Ben Shapiro. I, so. He's small, he's an annoying, pal. snarky little brat too. But <laughs> he's at the his the problem with Ben Shapiro for me is he's actually fucking skilled and talented and smart. He's so good, and, dude. So I fucking hate that. But yeah. he's also a snarky little bitch. But he. Uh, <laughs> He he was saying he's like, oh, they're they're, they're doing some comedy special with all these celebrities where they're going to be. It's a climate change comedy special. He goes, oh, that sounds fun. He just sit around and listen to a bunch of liberals lecture me on how whether I should drive my car or not. And I was like, oh, he's got a point though. You know, if we're if everything we're doing is is for the sake of like getting the language around social justice right, like we are really going to lose some fucking social battles. 
You know, we we can try to become Denmark all day long, but we're not because we got 50 no. states the size of Denmark that all operate, they all want to operate on their own frequency to some degree. That's the importance of, of the states' rights right there. The, culturally, culturally, there we have less in common culturally with someone in the deep south, right? We've got, I mean, regionally even, like we got fucking mountains. We have a rainforest up here. It's just, it's completely different. Um, Texas has its own distinct culture. Oregon, Washington have their own distinct weird little cultures, and we we can't be governed the same way. That's and that's why I mean, look at it. We're already breaking the federal protocol in Oregon by legalizing mushrooms, legalizing weed. Uh, you got to let every other. You got to let states run themselves. Like we are a loosely allied set of states that make up the United States, and we need to. And we're getting like obviously we push back. A lot of people push back with marijuana. All these states are like, no, 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 no. We we're, it's legal here, you know. And so I don't know. Like cutting the funding is is one that i mean <clears throat> and that, that said though there are certain times it, morally right like especially in the 60s and 70s when oh boy i'm gonna probably get this wrong google this tomorrow i believe it was <clears throat> i think it's harry s truman sent down paratroopers to a southern state to force them to integrate integrate and they had troopers posted up at the school for the year when they allowed black students in oh, and yeah. that like, so there are certain, huh? I said, I, yeah, I mean, sorry. I no, believe, will you pull that up? I'm not sure if that's the president that was sitting, but I, I don't I, know if that's the president. I remember the conversation with uh, Kamala Harris going after Biden during one of the debates about, um, about uh, busing. And I remember back when I first got into school, I God, I forgot what class it was for. But I had to write a paper on some subject. I think it was one of those things where the teacher hands out a bunch of things and, you know, you blindly fold it out, flip it over. And like, that's the subject you have to write about. And I'd never heard of busing before. And I wrote about it. And what I learned was like busing was a terrible federal program. It was a great program for certain societies and for certain like uh, communities around the country. What worked in Chicago didn't necessarily work in like rural Georgia. and. So because Joe Biden said that, essentially, Kamala Harris went after him during one of the debates. I, and that's where I lost Kamala Harris is when she, she kind of took that low blow. Anyway, that, you know, some people, some historians could probably tear what I'm saying apart. But I just I think that there's some some things that the states absolutely I think cannabis legalization, like there will come a point where. It'll be the law of the land, you know, gay right. I, I don't think that I think it's just the the verdict's in. Like if if you can't be cool with gay people being gay, then you're kind of just you're you're behind the mark, right? You're just you're gonna be left behind. I think there's certain things. I think healthcare, we the healthcare industry is kind of it's been predatory enough to where something's got to give, right? There's certain things I think the federal government should be doing, but I think that ex there's experiments that the states should be trying. And that's why I like the cannabis thing. You know, let the states try it. Let them, let them, let the next state figure it out. Let this, and then you can domino effect on top of it. And if it all folds, then it was never meant to be. But Word. if it thrives, like I know right now, I don't drive, I don't walk down the road with a bunch of stoned out fucking predatory junkies trying to, mm -hmm. you know, wh whatever the fear mongering shit was. I go down to the store and I pick, I want a 6% CBD and a 13% THC of this. And I want a, you know, hybrid of this. And I want, and then I went night when, after we get down with this podcast, it's probably right now, but I want to get on this podcast. I'll go in and I'll say, okay, how, how am I feeling tonight? And I'll pick out the thing that was regulated and grown for the specific use that I want it for. And that's a really nice, and it's cheaper than it was when I used to have to wait for my, you know, buddy to come over with a bunch of his fucking, you know, sketchy friends. Swag weed, yeah. With his shitty weed and he can call it Afghani fucking whatever all day long. And I pay it because that's, you know, I don't want to wait 
two days for the next guy to come around. It's yeah. it, this is nice, but let the states figure it out. Let the states drive this stuff. But I don't think Demarco. What's Sorry. Up, what were you going to say, DeMarco? Oh, uh, so it wasn't Truman. Uh, Truman Damn integrated it. the army. Uh, it was okay. Eisen- Eisenhower sent troops to Little, Lo- Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. <sighs> That's what it was. Yeah, he sent in. Yeah, he did. Was it the Airborne? He, I think he dropped him in. I don't know. I could be wrong now. I, that that but sounds I know a little that dramatic was a- for for that but i don't know if i don't know if i don't know if he had people parachuting into middle schools shit dude that'd be sick um i don't know maybe i i I don't know i feel like there was troopers there were troopers of some sort damn it uh thank you and i also um sorry to my history teachers i know that's that's upsetting but listen man um we're definitely over i want to get you on again as soon as you as, sh- as soon as you get that documentary okay. done, I want to yeah. get on there and promote it, and I can't wait to watch it. Um, I I admire your courage and the fact that you know you have admitted that <clears throat> you are ready to join the libertarian clan. <laughs> um, we welcome you, sir. And and you listen, if you have a little bit of republic, it's okay to have a little R in you, dude. It's all right. And I'm just kidding, buddy. But uh, I, I appreciate you doing this, man. Um, and uh, we got to do it again. I'll let people know where they can find you too, brother. To be honest with you, not a lot of places at the moment. I kind of turn. Oh, my, sh- I yo, shut things yo. down, man. I just, uh, I mean, you can Good follow you. at Lathan Media, but it's not. A, I'm just, I, I'm taking a social media break. And actually, before we started this this uh, podcast, I was like, you know, I. Don't I? I should probably warn him that I turned off all news media like right before the election last November. I I turned down. I started shutting down my social media. Started turning down all my. I just don't follow any of the 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 new stuff really. Um, focusing on different things and uh, yeah, good good for you. Kind of bigger picture stuff and smaller picture stuff. Uh, uh, well, dude, that's I mean that's what it's about, man. I'm proud of you. And uh, keep it up, man. Keep growing. Keep learning, and um, keep keep grinding, man. Because you you you've got a beautiful story to tell the world, and and um, I can't wait to I can't wait to, to see what's going to happen in the future for you. Well, thanks guys for having me on, and uh, Rick, both you guys, keep it up. We'll do, man. All right, brother. Peace. Thanks for listening, guys. Peace.